Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another NetHope Solution Center webinar. My name is Madeline No, and I'm with NetHope. And today our webinar topic is COVID-19 Health Data Management and Exchange. And today we're joined by BAO Systems, Catholic Relief Services, and Demagi. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for our session today. We'd like you to keep the session interactive. Please post your comments and questions in the Zoom chat window for our uh, moderated Q&A discussion toward the end of the hour. Also look for a follow-up email later today or early tomorrow that will include a link to the recording for this session and any collateral and other materials and links uh, to more information from the session today and it will be located on the NetHope Solution Center. Also we would love your feedback. Please respond to our webinar satisfaction poll that will be presented after the webinar today. And with that I will hand it off to Sonia Rutzel from Catholic Relief Services. Thank you very much Madeline. And thank you very much, NetHope, for facilitating this webinar with us. Um, uh, yeah, this is a webinar part of the ICT4D conference virtual event series. And um, we're very happy to have um, three expert speakers with us uh, to share their um, insights on health data management and exchange, um, particularly with the focus on supporting digital COVID response. And they will share how they have been or are adjusting to uh, support governments and partners across the globe in collecting, managing, exchanging and reporting health data. And um, particularly we'll be focusing today on interoperability, integration and collaboration. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I will um, like to introduce you to our speaker panel. We have uh, Jonathan Jackson, he's the co-founder and chief executive of Dimagi. Catherine Liu, she's the director of business development at BAO Systems. Nathan Barthel, he's the senior manager and ICT for D business development and program design at Catholic Relief Services. So thank you all very much um, for joining us today and sharing your insights. Each of the speaker will give a short presentation and then after this we will have um, a discussion, interactive discussion across the panel. So we'd like to invite the audience to place any um, questions in the chat box, um, either address it to one of the speakers or if it is uh, questions that are more general to this topic, um, feel free to ask those too and we'll um, collect all those and address those later. So thank you so much. And uh, I leave it um, to our first speaker, Jonathan, to kick us off with um, your insights and your work um, at DMAGI over the last few months. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is a quick set of about five or six slides just on what DMAGI has been doing with our COVID-19 response. For those who are not familiar with us, we have an open source platform called ComCare, which lets us build multiple applications for COVID-19 response uh, very rapidly. We can go to the next slide. Um, we have focused heavily on making sure that we are providing a multi-channel approach. So in our local response systems, we have focused um, both on the web and mobile. This is a bit different than we had previously seen in global health. Typically, a lot of our deployments are offline Android deployments. In uh, the COVID-19 local response, we've had uh, a lot more demand for the web application experience. Um, this is due to a lot of contact tracers being in more urban environments, um, the workforce being a bit more dedicated and higher equipped. Um, so laptops or desktops were more of an option. And that has been something that's uh, an interesting trend we saw in the adoption early on. As we look to fold this back into health systems, we anticipated going back to a much more offline mobile experience that aligns to many of the more traditional frontline worker roles that we see. Another huge adoption has been SMS and WhatsApp. Um, so we have our uh, bi-directional SMS engine that's been very popular for reaching out directly to patients, um, but also to communicate with frontline workers and healthcare officials. You may be wanting to get in daily symptom trackers or uh, suspected cases or persons under investigation with respect to COVID-19. All of these are difficult to do if you have to deploy new equipment, particularly given that we have uh, limited mobility right now. And so going after existing channels like SMS and WhatsApp has also been a very popular um, aspect. You can go to the next slide. One of the things that we did early on within COVID-19 in February and March was recognize that this was going to have a lot of the same use cases that we've seen in prior outbreaks with Ebola. 
And so we quickly um, put out template applications that span a whole variety of use cases. Um, DHIS2 also had a very similar approach and some of the other open source platforms as well. These were the common use cases that we kept seeing come up during Ebola, and we have definitely seen come up over and over again now with COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to go through all these applications, but each one allows the end consumer of ComCare to rapidly start from a template application and then deploy this. It's been interesting to see the adoption of these. Um, a lot of them have served as good data models or reference points for what is possible on the platform. But we do see a lot of people um, starting from their existing health system strengthening applications and then either starting from scratch to add in similar use cases or copying a single form. The wholesale adoption of these applications has been a bit more difficult for organizations, I think. Um, and so what's been very, very helpful is to get people to see what's possible on the platform, but then often there's a heavy amount of customization that's going on to meet the needs of the local environment. Can we go next? Um, one I want to highlight on very specifically is the contact tracing and case investigation work we've been doing. This template is quite advanced um, and it's meant for a high throughput outbreak level uh, case investigation and contact tracing. And what we saw both in the United States where we're doing work um, as well as in the global health is the need to really think about each role as a team. So there's the surveillance team and the special investigations unit for persons under investigation. This team gets deployed when you have an active outbreak of COVID-19. You might need to be doing mass testing um, or you're uh, getting inbound from port of entry and you need to test an entire plane. That alone requires its own management of the population and referral to next stage upstream. Once you have a positive case, this thing goes over to the case investigators. They're the ones asking you who your contacts are, where you've been, and eliciting all that information into the system. And then finally, you have the contact tracers. What's been interesting is that in places that have very high outbreaks and you have you know, hundreds or thousands of contact tracers, um, this, these three teams need to be highly segmented from a workflow perspective. But when you have much lower levels of outbreak, these might be three integrated roles. That's actually very difficult to design from a user experience perspective. And that's been a big challenge for um, our organization, a lot of our partners to figure out what is the right balance for planning to be able to handle future outbreaks versus hit a lower level of need right now. Two other subteams that have come up a lot are the notion of community hubs. So outside of the pure clinical workflow of COVID-19, how are we supporting the individual or the household who might need assistance during quarantine or might need assistance during isolation or might generally have already been availing of public services that are no longer available. And that is something that's been a big challenge in our, our different environments is to figure out how to integrate the clinical workflows with these community-based services. And then again, sending out investigation teams to learn more about what, what might be going on in a particular geographic environment. Next slide. Um, one of the key things that we talked a lot about, and, and we do have a global portfolio of work with COVID-19 in both high resource settings and, and LMICs. And it's interesting how much the digital principles for development resonated during our sales process in higher income settings. So this next slide is literally straight out of um, my uh, pitch deck, and if we can go to the next one. Um, and you'll notice these concepts are exactly what we talk about all the time in our digital principles uh, for development. So it's gotta be intuitive. Um, we have a lot of users in all of our markets that are first time tech users. This is a very complicated workflow to do case investigation and contact tracing, so the user experience has to be incredibly intuitive. Landing a bunch of data entry screens in front of the user is gonna be confusing and get bad data and bad workflow into the system. Second, it's gotta be scalable. Um, the Monkey supports over half a million global uh, frontline workers. Um, so we knew we could handle the scale of, of thousands of contact tracers coming online quickly, but this was still a big concern with a lot of public health officials as they were looking at what would be their contact tracing solution. And finally, it's gotta be configurable. Each outbreak is at a different stage in countries, um, whether you're at the earlier part of the curve, the height of the curve, or coming back down the other side. And also, it's got to configure and interoperate with the rest of the health system, as I'm sure BAO will talk about in their amazing work. Um, so these three selling points were, were really, really resonant with public health officials in markets that are not in a traditional global health market. And it was really exciting to see that all the lessons learned and all the work we've been doing in global health really is exactly what the public health officials um, wanted to talk about and, and wanted to leverage in the platform. Okay, next slide. Um, and that, that just moves into one case study that I want to highlight, which was what we did in San Francisco here in the United States in the state of California. Um, we were able to take the lessons learned from Ebola, the lessons learned from uh, other contact tracing projects we've done, and deploy a robust and sophisticated contact tracing solution with San Francisco 
um, and the Department of Health, who has partnered with one of the local universities we have here in the United States, uh, the University of California at San Francisco, to build the surveillance system. And they added hundreds of contact tracers very quickly to the system. And within about seven days, due to everything we've learned in global health, we were able to do a system that had all of the following characteristics for case investigation and contact tracing. And I think that's just a testament to our global health community and how far we've come on the digital health side. And it was really, really exciting to see all these lessons learned could help um, here in the U United States where Demonte is headquartered um, with the COVID-19 outbreak that is you know, very difficult in our, our country right now but that the lessons that we've learned are, uh, in our global health work have applied um, so specifically. So happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, yes, as I said, please um, place your questions in the chat and we will um, address those to the speakers afterwards. Um, but before we really like to hear from Catherine Liu about how a BAO system is adjusting to the current pandemic and supporting an integrated response to reduce the impact of COVID-19. Catherine, um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you that um, are not aware of BAO systems, we are a technology company based in Washington, D.C., and a lot of the work that we have really been done has been around supporting the implementation of DHIS2. Um, with that being said, uh, we definitely provide a lot of support around uh, integration and data exchange. Next slide, please. So regarding our response, um, to COVID-19, as the trajectory of the pandemic has altered, BAO systems has similarly evolved from initially at the outset, prioritizing COVID-19 surveillance systems to strengthening um, to now where we find ourselves in the midst of the pandemic, strengthening the monitoring of essential health services within the context of COVID. So we offer a suite of COVID-19 preparedness and response applications that really seek to fill in existing gaps um, of health information systems to improve data integration and interoperability and facilitate integrated data analysis. Um, again, the emphasis is really on being able to fill in those gaps. And so we don't want to replace um, existing tools and existing capacities in country. Jonathan just spoke a lot about ComCare and so again, while we offer data collection services, if care is being used on the ground and there's a cadre of healthcare workers that are very used to ComCare, then certainly uh, continuing data collection and expanding data collection for COVID makes sense to stay within the same system. Ideally, what we want to be able to do is uh, really help organizations and countries to better identify and predict emerging hotspots for local COVID-19 transmission to improve planning allocation and reallocation of commodities, supplies, medicines, and human resources to ensure that essential services are able to continue, um, particularly with the surge of uh, COVID-19 patients. And then to support monitoring in changes of healthcare access, both geographically and amongst vulnerable populations, such as women, children, and people living with HIV AIDS. Um, and so those people that are most likely to suffer um, due to a, a decrease in service access. Next slide, please. So starting out with data collection, we developed a number of modules using Dharma platform, which was acquired at the beginning of this year by BAO Systems. Um, and these modules are able to support rapid data data collection in the context of COVID-19. Some of the examples include a COVID-19 self-assessment module, which follows CDC guidelines and enables healthcare workers to monitor their own exposure and symptoms daily. And it also serves to help facility managers monitor um, the safety of their own healthcare staff. Our return to work application follows the same principles of the self-assessment module, but allows for anonymous data collection. And then we also are, have created a rapid health facility assessment to support the monitoring and evolving capacity of facilities to provide essential health services, assess disruptions to service delivery and workforce capacity. 
as well as the availability of essential medicines, supplies, and supplies, including uh, personal protection equipment. So just a little bit of background um, on Dharma Platform, since most users, um, it's a fairly new application for them. Um, it has a point and click interface, um, which makes it really easy to quickly set up a data collection form. Data can be collected offline and immediately syncs to uh, the cloud when cellular or Wi-Fi connectivity is available. One of the great advantages of Dharma Platform is that it has mesh networking, which allows for synchronization of data between two offline devices, so that if one person, data collector, is out in the field with a long-term uh, lack of connectivity, um, if they come into contact with another healthcare worker that's covered data collector, they can actually sync uh, the data between the two devices. And then once the one person who is closer to connectivity comes into uh, internet or Wi-Fi, or cellular or Wi-Fi, excuse me, then they can actually upload um, into the cloud both data collectors information. Um, it's uh, encrypted on device in transit and at rest and as you can see has a really simple interface interface again these are for um, context where existing data collection tools are not currently being used and where there is a need to rapidly scale up a data collection form so rather than weeks to develop a form um, a form can be developed and deployed automatically or instantaneously within a matter of a day or two next slide please um, so here we're showing uh, the what we've the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID surveillance data. Many of you guys might be aware that Johns Hopkins has a uh, outwardly facing uh, COVID nineteen surveillance tracker, and what we've done is to connect to their API and ingest those data into a DHIS two instance. Um, the, these data allow us to monitor changes in the pandemic on a daily basis. Right now, uh, as many of you guys are familiar with, uh, the University of Oslo released a number of DHIS2 surveillance metadata packages. Um, currently, it's operational in 28 countries and in development in an additional 22 countries. There are several advantages to the widespread implementation of DHIS2 for uh, the COVID-19 metadata packages, including global alignment and reporting of standardized indicators that align with WHO recommendations, as well as opportunities for data integration and interoperability with HMIS. Leveraging our BAO integration driver, which facilitates data flow between multiple DHI DHIS2 instances, we're able to exchange data between existing HMIS and these newly developed COVID-19 surveillance systems, enabling more granular and responsive analysis of how COVID spreads, how COVID spread is impacting health service delivery. Furthermore, we're in a unique position to be able to compile data across uh, these COVID-19 surveillance systems um, into a global level surveillance system. So again, what I'm showing here is Johns Hopkins data, but for most countries, um, with the exception of the United States, the information really remains at the country level and more granular access to data are not available. But given the widespread use of DHIS2 for national level surveillance systems in, in many of the countries that we work in, there is that ability to integrate all of the um, DHIS2 information and gain access to more granular data at the global level. Next slide, please. So in addition to facilitating DHIS2 to DHIS2 integration, we also support integration with other commonly used systems. Um, showing here are you know, just a couple of examples, but we also have facilitated integration um, into DHIS2 from Google Sheets, OpenMRS, um, ComCare, and our own Dharma platform. Uh, we've also facilitated integration between DHIS2 and OpenLMIS and have built out C-Stock in DHIS2. 
And so the integration suite really allows for more open data exchange and integrated analysis between information systems. Next slide, please. So in contexts that require more extensive data and systems integration for improved data analysis, our BAO analytics platform offers the ability to ingest, align, and make available multiple and varied data sets for integrated analysis and connection to leading analytics and BI tools. Um, so what I'm showing here is just a simple interface showing the various different types of connectors that are available into the, to the BAO analytics platform. Um, one of the advantages to the BAO analytics platform is that it provides access to a wide range of publicly available data sets um, in a curated manner so that we've sort of scoured the, uh, the global environment to see what data may be of interest to organizations in health and development and have looked at things ranging from human resource uh, for health information from the WHO to funding information uh, across different global funders um, to global burden of disease as well as things like food and agriculture security and climate change. Next slide please. So again this is just showing um, a image of a dashboard created using superset analyzing the COVID-19 data. I mean, essentially with the analytics platform, we want to be able to help facilitate organizations and countries to ingest data um, from uh, multiple uh, data sources and systems to prepare and align the data using a common data reference table to enrich their analyses with this curated uh, public data set library and make those data more comprehensively available for machine learning tools and uh, predictive analytics, and then to be able to just share more widely these data on a dashboard. Uh, next slide. That's actually the end of, of my system, so I'm happy to answer any questions and can be contacted uh, during the rest of the session or offline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, before we uh, have time for discussion, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Nate Barthel to share um, the implementer's perspective on health data management during the COVID pandemic. Um, so, Nate, if you would like to share your thoughts, thank you. Sure, thanks, Sonia. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, perfect. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, yeah, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, let me pause here for a second. Um, so first of all, it's, it's an honor to be able to share with you. Um, um, I hope what I have to share today is, is useful and interesting. Um, there's a lot of people who don't doing some really amazing stuff out there who know far more about this than I do. So I approach this uh, humbly, but I wanna, I wanna share with you uh, what I've learned. Um, it, when Sonia approached me about this, I was a little confused about what I wanted to share. Um, COVID-19 has, has impacted all of our work across the board, not just health, but, but in just about every aspect. Um, and certainly probably most of you have, you know, seen upticks or interest in things like use of SMS and IVR. And I could have talked about that because um, we have been seeing a lot of interest in that and doing, doing a lot of that. But what I thought I'd do is spend some time um, talking about the work. Um, There's just two slides, uh, so it should be pretty quick, but talking about some of the work that I've done I've been involved with very um, uh, intimately uh, over the last several years, and that is uh, our work in the malaria space. So what I wanna do is talk about kind of our malaria work and then um, kind of cross cut that with what, how COVID-19 has impacted that in, in two sort of examples. And I think um, there's probably a lot of different other ways that it's impacted, but I wanted to focus on those two. So um, could you go to the next slide, please? All right, um, so the first thing is actually not a technology thing. Well, it is, it's part technology and part, part not, part just processes. And I wanted to talk about how uh, we've adapted some of our processes in light of uh, COVID-19 and also uh, how we've leveraged some of the uh, external data sets to improve our, our work and tracking of our progress. Um, so first, um, 
I imagine uh, a number of you on a call are familiar with malaria work and kind of the different interventions that um, are undertaken throughout the globe, but I'm gonna focus on one particular type. It's called uh, net mass campaigns or LLIN uh, mass campaigns. Uh, LLIN stands for long lasting insecticide treated nets. I, they go by different things, but it's basically nets that are treated. And in, in countries with uh, a high malaria burden, uh, a common approach is essentially to blanket the country in nets so that uh, usually it's one net for every two people. Um, so they go around literally hand out nets to just about every other person in the country. Uh, so these are massive scale operations. Um, and the basic, um, there's a, typically a giant workforce, you know, it could be if, you, if you're trying to cover a country, it could be several thousand people out there doing this, you know, maybe 10,000, depending on the, the size of the population. But the basic, um, uh, process is pretty straightforward and we've done this we've done this digitally um, so basically you have a, a registration component where you go to the household and you register the household how many people basic demographics and that kind of stuff um, and we did this digitally so it captures all that information digitally including location and all that kind of stuff um, they're issued a, a coupon or can be coupons depending on the approach and on that coupon is a QR code that's then associated with the household um, and that at a point in the future, um, you know, maybe 10 days down the road or something like that, or sometimes a little bit longer, they go all go to a pre-specified distribution point. Um, so you can imagine lots of people going to one distribution point um, and, um, and uh, turning their vouchers in, their scan, they receive a net. Um, oh, one thing I want to mention here is, let me, let me layer in this, this Maxar data set. Maxar data is is um, is a new initiative funded by the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to digitize all of the structures in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so I haven't talked about this picture yet, but I'm going to here right now. So what you're seeing here is actual structures, buildings, uh, households, um, and the ones in green have been visited. Um, they've been in this case registered, and the ones in red have either not been visited or they visited and declined, or it's a shop or something like that. Um, so this is really important because one of the challenges in, in net coverage, ah, one of the challenges in mass campaigns is net coverage and making sure you've covered all the households. Um, so we use that um, going into this primarily thinking about registration. Do we have complete registration of the, of the country um, with the denominator being this literal um, polygons that you see here? Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, this particular campaign in Benin, um, the distribution um, was planned to take place in the March-April time frame of this year. And you can imagine that caused a lot of problems because that means a lot of people going to one place. Um, and so they, they paused. They said, oh, gosh, the, the COVID-19 is getting out of control. It's the news. The country's going lockdown. Um, what are we going to do? Um, and they pivoted, and uh, kudos to the government. They, they made the decision they had to continue. Um, they felt like the, the risk of uh, malaria and the deaths associated that um, outweighed, and in fact, far outweighed the risk associated with COVID-19. Um, so they proceeded, but they, they did it, instead of going a distribution point-based distribution, they went house to house. They basically did the reverse of um, the registration. And they were able to use this data set to do the reverse and to track that reverse distribution. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting way to leverage data and to pivot um, um, program activities and processes to adapt to this context. Um, in some other uh, countries, we're also seeing them um, proceed with a single phase distribution. So there's no registration, then you come back later for distribution. So again, we're seeing just changes in in, in fundamental processes for how these, these campaigns take place and, and may continue uh, long after COVID-19. So why don't we skip over to the next slide. Okay, what you're seeing here is a dashboard. Sorry, the picture's a little blurry, but I think it'll get the, the, um, the point across. What I, what I wanna talk about here is the theme of leveraging program data, in this case, malaria data to support COVID-19 work. Um, I think a lot of us are involved with projects that collect a lot of data. And um, 
that data is not just useful for that project, but potentially other things. So what you're seeing here is actually a registration dashboard. The spikes you see are actually the, the daily registration activities. You know, day one is on the far left, and the last day is a little, little blip on the far right. Um, and this is Kano State in Nigeria. It's an absolutely enormous state with an enormous population of 16 million. Um, and this data here represents a really rich data set. Um, so we have household location, demographics, uh, you know, household size, uh, in some cases, phone numbers, um, you know, all of this information. And that's really, uh, it's sensitive information, yes. It's also really valuable information um, that could be used in conjunction with other data sets to inform the government um, in their uh, decision-making processes for, for COVID response. Um, so in Nigeria, um, you know, we've got about a third of the states covered in terms of this data. In Benin, the entire country. Um, um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that as an opportunity. Um, and this is where I think we need much more, yeah, what do I want to say here? This ultimately needs to be led by the government. This is not something that CRS can do. This is the government's data um, and they need to, um, or should they want to, um, use this data to support that work, we need to be able to help them to, to do that effectively. Um, so those are just a couple of observations of what I've seen. Um, um, and hopefully that was of some interest to all of you. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Nate. And thank you uh, to our speakers for um, sharing your insights and your work and for offering a great and diverse oversight. And we like to engage in a discussion. And I said, um, we're particularly interested in talking a little bit more about um, integration, interoperability and collaboration, but we also have some other questions from, from our audience. Um, so let's dive in. The first question is uh, for Jonathan. And then also I'd like to ask Catherine uh, to comment as well, please. Um, so Jonathan, you mentioned the importance of rapid development and scalability. And then Catherine, you mentioned the importance of reuse of existing systems. Um, is the pa pandemic triggering new demands for interoperability? And if so, um, how are DMAGI and BO system responding? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's triggering um, certainly the demand for ComCare and DHIS2 integration. There was significant demand prior to COVID as well, just in our core health systems work. But it's basically a given um, at this point that, that almost uh, every government has DHIS2 either as their core HMIS platform or as a component. And so we, we basically take it as a given uh, these days that when we're deploying um, ComCare for frontline worker use case, that we are going to want to flow that data back into DHIS2. So we've been trying to continue to strengthen um, that, which is now a core component of ComCare. Um, BAO also has a very powerful ingest that they can help support that with. And then OpenHIE also has uh, different components and ways to get data between ComCare and DHIS2. Um, so we certainly have seen that uh, demand go up. Um, and one of the one of the challenges, and, and Andrew um, Cantor had also just put this in the chat, is around making interoperability easier. Um, you know, a lot of ComCare applications are customized based on the local needs. A lot of DHIS2 metadata is customized based on the local needs. And so as those two uh, get customized in different directions, the cost and complexity of the integration continues to go up. Um, so one of the things that, that continues to be a challenge is the time and effort and, and cost of that business analyst and business requirement function that really understands deeply how to ensure high value integrations. I think we're going to continue to see a gap in the, the global health community and that skill set, um, which is an incredibly important skill set right now for, um, you know, not just between ComCare and DHIS2, but many different ways of moving data between systems and improving data liquidity. Um, that kind of data engineer, data architect, data integration um, role is going to continue to be more and more in high demand, I think, going forward. Hi, just to add on to what Jonathan um, was saying that I agree. I think that there has been a lot of demand for integration and interoperability leading into the COVID pandemic. And then certainly given the pandemic, there has been greater emphasis. Um, there is a lot of complexity around facilitating 
integration between systems, um, as Jonathan mentioned, because the complexity of systems and the difference, the difference, um, the unique differences between systems from country to country. I think, you know, we've been having ongoing discussions with ComCare about how we can improve the user experience um, around data integration between our two, between DHIS2 and ComCare, and that is sort of always at the forefront of our mind um, and something that we want to be able to put back out to the community. Certainly, um, funding is a huge challenge in order to drive some of this. Um, I think one of the challenges with the COVID pandemic is that a lot of the actors have wanted to respond really early, um, but a lot of the funding just wasn't there because of um, political conversations going on at the funder level and the release of, of money to be able to spur some of this new development um, has definitely been a challenge. Um, I think regarding, regarding what BAO Systems is doing around integration and interoperability, I think there's a number of opportunities that we have certainly our integration driver enables the DHIS2 to DHIS2. Um, I think a spin on that is looking at um, individual level data collection systems such as ComCare or OpenMRS or OpenSRP and how those data can be aggregated from those individual systems and then reported into DHIS2 to make for more seamless um, reporting at higher levels of the health system. Um, I think that uh, looking across systems and more broadly at integration that, you know, BAO systems at least offers, we have data architects um, that have been working in this space to help drive the design of, of many of these things, but it still requires capacity on the ground to help uh, do tasks like mapping of indicators. You know, as many of you guys know, even something as simple as mapping um, health facilities and uh, can be a challenge between systems. And so when you look more broadly at the multitude of data elements and indicators that one needs to uh, import and export between systems, um, that can get quite challenging um, in a very short period of time. Maybe I can just jump in here with one quick note is that often we'll, we'll get requests um, you know, internally, all of these systems must be interoperable. I will say that word has a lot of different meanings to different people, and it's kind of a gray word. So I think part of it is COVID-19 or otherwise is to unpack what that actually means. I think there's many degrees of interoperable. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also thank you for already um, answering a, a bunch of the other questions that we had around standardization. Um, I um, obviously with um, now I think more emphasized through the through the current pandemic and uh, the digital COVID response. Um, the we, we see more um, a multi-sectoral um, um, approaches to to well to obviously through the through the COVID response, but also um, through um, uh, um, I guess general um, uh, development and, and and humanitarian aid. And um, and is it so? Do you think um, um, since all the work is linked to 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 data, and um, no matter the sector, is it possible to also consider data that is not yet integrated? So, for example, um, climate data, or maybe traffic data, animal health data, or data from other sectors. And are there any plans to, um, yeah? consider uh, uh, in integration of those and um, yeah or are there do we need different partnerships or collaborations to make that happen um, and sorry I didn't address that to anybody no, I, specifically. I, can I maybe have a stab at that one Sonia please please yeah yeah so no I, I think it's a good question and I'd kind of refer back to my last slide there where we have these um, no, it's not the same across all countries different countries have different data sets but at least in the countries that I've been working in, we have really rich data sets that um, could be used um, to inform COVID response or any other response for that matter. Um, and I think definitely layering on that um, um, other data sets. So in, in the case of COVID-19, maybe you take that population data set and maybe there's like, uh, I don't know, I'm just 
guessing here, you know, cell phone data traffic where you can, you can figure out where people are traveling and, and those types of things. Um, uh, you know, climate certainly. So there's all sorts of data sets um, that could be useful bringing together to answer these, um, answer these questions. I think the tough part is you need an organization that can really grapple with that. That's a really, um, it's two things. One is being able to mash together those data sets. I think that's one skill set. But there's also a kind of an art to that as well. Um, determining what what are the questions that you're trying to answer? What are the data? What's the data that's available? And and you know how can we analyze this to to come up with with valuable answers? And there's there's definitely some some an art in there in sort of um, uh, what do you call it? Like a data deep dive and really trying to figure out well what what can we determine from this data set? So I think there's a couple different things going on there, and I think it's a very interesting and a very particular skill set to be able to to do that and to leverage um, different data sets to answer a question. This is Catherine yeah. from BAO Systems. I was just going to add to what Nathan was saying that um, absolutely, Sonia, I think that the ability to integrate a wide range of data sets is in, certainly valuable. Um, this is something that BAO Systems is doing with our analytics platform where we are taking the idea that well health is influenced by a myriad of factors, including agriculture and food security, violence prevention, environmental factors such as climate and topography. Um, you know, the list sort of goes on. Um, one of the reasons that has spurred us to sort of make available this public library of, or this library of publicly available data sets is really to enable people to do these types of complex analyses where you can look at, um, you know, particularly for COVID, to be able to look at demography data, population density data to identify where are those geographic locations and who are those populations of people that are at highest risk. And some of the evidence that's coming out from the CDC around risk factors being increased by obesity, you know, that points us to understanding what what is the prevalence of obesity within a country? Where, um, where do those populations live? Is it in rural areas? Is it in cities? Is it in population dense areas? Um, and so looking across the combination of risk factors um, of lung issues, um, weather patterns and, and how that might actually change a person's or a community's uh, risk profile, for example, for COVID, or any other emerging um, disease, I think is is really important. I think one of the challenges, um, like Nathan also alluded to, is the sort of buy-in from a stakeholder to understand what is it that they actually want to get out of the data, and where is that sort of skill set to help uh, support these analysis, and certainly, I think from from BAO Systems, the, this is something that we are extremely interested in. We have a collection of, you know, we have sort of the technical capacity to bring these myriad of, of data sets together, and then leveraging our data scientists and epidemiologists, really trying to see what are those those interesting data analysis questions that can be useful for organizations or for countries as they plan their response. Um, again, not just for COVID, but just as we continue to look towards the future. Um, and then being able to bring in machine learning tools to actually do much more um, thorough data mining and looking for um, more discrete risk factors that might not be picked up by a regular data scientist by just doing an analysis, but really bringing in all these different data sets together to be able to predict where, you know, where are the geographic areas and populations that are going to have um, the most concerns about food security in the context of COVID, as an example. And, and how is it that we're going to be able to maintain essential services to those hardest to reach populations. Excellent, thank you. Um, and obviously we cannot talk about, um, well actually we have some questions around collaboration 
um, there are some general questions, and maybe um, no, I'll ask Jonathan to <laughs> see where, um, if you'd like to answer this one, um, or a part of it. Um, Obviously, um, how, how can different um, actors or data managers join and minimize duplication of efforts? So how are you working with other organizations, whether it's around um, digital capacity building or training, support, awareness? Um, well, yeah, do you, what, what are the current efforts or what, where do you think there is um, more need um, for collaboration? Yeah, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> Collaboration is interesting in the context of COVID-19. So when, when I think this was first getting going in March and April, and it was very clear this was gonna have a massive impact on the communities many of us on this call are in or uh, try to support, there's a huge um, positive energy around collaboration and just trying to make sure everybody could support the best approach. And we were all talking about not duplicating efforts and making sure we're reusing the existing tools that are there. Um, and then the funding started to kind of trickle in and then the funding started to get bigger and then there was a lot of political jockeying for which system was going to do what. And I think what we saw and see is like, even still, governments are being overwhelmed by pitches by vendors like BAO and Damagi and others who, um, you know, rightfully think they have a great solution that can add value. But I think they're feeling a bit overwhelmed with the different myriad of options and what is proven, what is new, um, you know, calling something Comcare or DHIS2, might, the feature might have never been deployed in production or it might be 10 years of proven experience. And so I think it's very hard even to tell with the experienced vendors um, what is uh, truly real and what is new. Um, and new is not bad, but experimental work is very dangerous to deploy in the context of a once in a generation global pandemic. And so I think what we've um, tried to espouse in our collaboration is trying to kind of stay at what we're good at and not stretch too much in ways that are very new to us that don't really fit what we're doing. And I think that's very important for collaboration because when there's so much potential, um, you know, you just heard Catherine and Nate talk about the, the myriad of things you can do with data. Um, there's just like all of our organizations have become digitally competent over the last 10 years. All of our organizations have become data consumers and data partners. So a lot of these use cases, there's probably 20 different partners in the country that the government has access to that, that all would be willing to help support this work. And so I think one of the most collaborative things we can do is try to get out of our, our own way in terms of forming partnerships and figuring out what is going to help support the COVID response the most. And I think that's a system-centric approach. You know, as Catherine mentioned, identifying pockets of higher risk is a critical activity to do, but then who are the parties and support actors that are able to respond to higher risk communities? What we're seeing here in our own um, country again in the United States where we have you know, significant resources um, in our private and public health systems and, and less so in our public health response systems but massive compared to, to almost any other setting is like we are finding it very difficult to adjust and adapt to how to respond to known higher risk subpopulations. And so I think a lot of what needs to happen at the collaborative level is finding out how to respond in ways that each of our organizations are respectively good at. And that's very difficult because you never know if you're gonna be the one who doesn't really have a role um, when we figure out what is the highest need. And I think that's just been a very big challenge in COVID-19 response. And we saw that with other response activities in, in prior um, natural disasters or outbreaks. And I think that's a, a huge challenge. And I think that also affects what Nate was saying around how to combine data sets and build data sets. Um, kind of everybody wants to be that lead data analysis role, um, you know, and then the one combining everything and providing an insight to the government. And like the, there's just as much need, if not more need on, on data privacy and data security and data interoperability, which might not be the quote unquote most, um, you know, fun part of the job, but which is critical because it's a blocker for surfacing those insights and ultimately making those insights actionable to lead to better outcomes. Thank you. Yes, um, as you yeah, as you said, a lot of um, implementers and health organizations or government agencies are definitely overwhelmed with all these different um, data packages and softwares available. Um, maybe Nate, could you maybe share some insights on how you think um, or how you would approach navigating through all that wealth of um, opportunities and potential solutions? How to identify a suitable partner? Yeah, um, so uh, 
as I've been sort of thinking about this and going back to some of these rich data sets that we have, I think the biggest challenge, and this kind of circles back to what Jonathan, Jonathan was saying, and I think it really starts with the government itself. Um, do they have to be keen on using it? They have to understand um, what the possibilities are. They have to drive that collaboration. Um, they they have to they have to be the champions of that. Um, and, and frankly, in some of the cases that I've worked on, I, I'm sort of mixed in terms of whether or not there's there's real real buy-in there to to do that. And I think if that's in place, other things fall in place. And then we can find the analytics partners, et cetera, to help grapple with the data and bring together the data sets. But I think it starts there. And I think without having the government in the picture um, and frankly driving it and saying, hey, we have this data. Can, can we do something with it to address this problem? And you know, or we have this other data set from the, the Ministry of Statistics and another one from you know whatever, from our local telecom. Um, Without that, um, I think it's very difficult to make make progress. So I think, I, I'm not really answering your question, but I think that that's a fundamental thing that needs to be in place for there to be any real real progress is, is for the government to um, see the possibility and drive that and say, hey, we, we wanna do this. We want to use this data um, to support our country and our work and our response to COVID-19. I think it's probably where I would start. Excellent, thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, Jonathan, you already mentioned the importance of um, data security. So we can obviously not talk about health data without at least um, uh, uh, touching upon this. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Catherine, I could ask you first the question, but everybody else, feel free to chip in. So, um, how does uh, data rights fit into the development of uh, large data sets, especially where households ID and contacts are involved? Um, where applied, does aggregation and anonymization reduce the value of the data? Um, government involvement may, may not support data or other rights. Thanks, Sonia. Um, yeah, this is definitely a tricky topic. Um, I think we find ourselves in an era of, you know, where many countries have differing policies. Um, I think one of the key things is is really understanding um, transparency in in data privacy policies, um, certainly so that individuals are aware of how their own information may be being used or being shared. I think in contexts where in situations where you know for contact tracing, for example, um, where individual information is being collected and you're sharing, you know the names of individuals that you may have been in contact with or, or the places and the locations where you have been, things like household IDs and, and individual uh, personal identifying information. Um, I think in the context of data analysis, um, I think it depends on the level in which the analysis is being performed, whether or not um, looking at aggregate data reduces the power of the data. Um, so let me be clear on that, that you know, for client case management, absolutely having that identifying information, I think is essential to maintain and follow up um, and ensure that individuals are receiving the care that they should um, and that households are receiving the information, the, the care that they should. I think beyond that more client case management aspect, Having aggregate data, I think, for most cases is actually sufficient if you're able to aggregate those data to a community level or to a facility and attribute those cases um, to a less granular site and that those data aggregated are enough to understand the picture and the context that is happening, the extent of the outbreak or the extent of by which services are um, being impeded because of the COVID pandemic, for example. Um, and that a lot of it just really depends on sort of what an, a data user's role is and how they're using that information and the granularity should really reflect that need. 
Um, so for a district to be able to see what's happening within their own district, I think having that community level data is sufficient. Um, obviously that's not going to be the case for an individual provider. And then at the global level, um, you know, whether or not we need site level data, I think that that is certainly debatable where people will want to say, yes, we absolutely need site level data. Um, I think I'm, I personally am on the more conservative side where I would say within a country and within a district, that site level data is definitely important for allocation and reallocation of uh, human and uh, resources as well as commodities and supplies. But at a global level, at headquarters, I probably do not need to see that site level data. Um, so I think it really is maintaining that fine boundary between what is absolutely essential and what information do you actually need to know, know to make those decisions and then being um, in alignment with those um, data needs. Yeah, to add to that, um, Catherine, I think one of the things we've seen, and we have, you know, significant amounts of highly sensitive data that we um, manage and support in, in over 50 countries. And I think it's, we've taken a stance to, you know, always prioritize individual data security. Our business model doesn't uh, monetize data in any way, shape or form. But one of the interesting things that's been clear from this um, global pandemic is, is personal privacy is not fully aligned with the interest of the public health. Um, you know, you can individually um, identify people, um, you may be able to provide them better public health as individuals or better public health in their community. And I think our data laws and experience and security frameworks and privacy frameworks are nowhere near well enough equipped um, to handle this type of conflict. And I think we're seeing that in a lot of the challenges governments are having in both high resource and low resource settings that, um, have uh you know don't have the legal frameworks to know how to handle this and you see this even in the united states again where where i'm based where you have very very tightly bound laws governing health data um, we have a, a regulation called hipaa you have tightly um, defined eu laws called gdpr um, yet you still have uh, data breaches and all sorts of uh, data leaks from companies that pay a very small fine and have an outstripped impact on privacy uh, concerns for that individual who has identity theft concerns going forward, yet there's no inverse um, property where you can say, well, the public benefit outweighs the downside of this um, security effort, how to have that discussion. Um, and I think there's a very, very small trust in big tech these days and a very small trust in big government these days. And so it's made this discussion incredibly difficult. And I think it is a huge challenge that we're seeing with like the potential ability to use data in, in a way that, that we all would kind of label as, as positive and global good, but that does have inherent conflicts with privacy. And I don't think we're well equipped to be having these discussions right now. Yeah, no, absolutely, Jonathan. I think you, you bring up a really good point. I mean, especially a lot of the conversations that have been happening here in the United States around data privacy um, and what is okay and what is not okay is, you know, we get pushed out new applications that monitor us without notification or, you know, how, what people's public awareness is of, of those things. And I would agree that largely the policies are far behind what the technology is able to do. And, and that is certainly a challenge. Thank you so much. I still have so many questions for you, but I think unfortunately we're out of time. What I might do is um, address those in a, um, offline and then we'll share those with the audience. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and joining the discussion. I thought it was very interesting. I learned a lot. And I think there is also, we, yeah, as I said, we, I think we opened an, a whole bunch of new questions. So. Um, before we uh, log off, I also uh, like to say that we're currently doing a call for good practice in uh, examples for user-centered or user-driven design for digital COVID response. This is uh, uh, following up from a previous webinar we did earlier this uh, month uh, on this platform here together with uh, NetHope. And um, if yeah, anyone in, in, in the audience or um, hearing this, this call, we will also share it um, virtually. Uh, has any examples to share, please do send me an email on info at ict4dconference.org as we are looking to put together a publication with some practical guidance. 
So that is all for me. Um, I thank you so much to uh, Jonathan, Catherine, and Nate um, for sharing your insights and for NetHope for facilitating us. Um, before you log off, please do fill out the um, evaluation um, uh, webinar evalu evaluation form and share your feedback with us, what you thought about this. And if you have any interest in certain topics we should cover in future, you can also message me directly. Um, so thank you so much for your time and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the attendees as well. Please take a moment to complete our webinar satisfaction poll. The link is in the chat window. And don't forget, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and uh, other information from this session. And please feel free to share that with your colleagues. Thanks again for attending and have a great rest of your day.